There are times in the midst of planning and preparing that I realize the Holy Spirit really truly is at work in ways that I could not uh, prepare for or uh, plan for. One of those moments is uh, through Barbara's, Barbara's words this morning. Um, she could have preached my sermon for me, so just know that as I go into this. It's already been done better than I could do it. She also stole everything that I was going to say. Um, so, which it was not her fault because there was a different passage in here, but I changed her out and we uh, intersected conveniently. In our passage today, the author of John uses a word for the first time that might be quite familiar to us. A word that might remind us of some of our family members or some of our friends or, heaven forbid, maybe some of us. The translation I read says complaining. The common English Bible uses the word grumbling, which I really like, grumbling. It's almost onomatopoeic, grumbling. The people who oppose Jesus, the ones who are confused or concerned about his presence, spend some time in this passage grumbling. When have you grumbled about something? What did you grumble about? Have you grumbled that things are not going the way you planned or that something was unfair? Have you grumbled that God seems to be absent when you needed God the most? What does your grumbling sound like? Now, I've said grumbling too many times, and uh, that, when that happens, it doesn't even feel like a word anymore to me. It just feels like an action, grumbling. There is an experience of the Israelites as they wander in the wilderness in the Old Testament in which they grumble. It's an instance to which Jesus refers later in this very passage. After the Israelites are freed from generations of bondage in Egypt, as they wander in the wilderness beyond the Red Sea, food and water become scarce. Living becomes quite rough, and the people start to lose their trust in God. They start to lose their hope that they will get through this. They lose faith that God will provide. So they begin to complain. They begin to grumble. They wish they could go back to Egypt, where at least they had food to eat and water to drink. They forget how terrible life was in the midst of their oppression, and they grumble. They grumble to Moses and Aaron. They grumble that God has abandoned them in the wilderness. They grumble that God is nowhere to be found. I think the Israelites create a perfect example of what we do so often when we grumble, especially when we grumble about our lives or about God's absence. We forget what God has done in the past, the times when God has provided for us when we were in need, or when God sustained us in the difficult moments. Like the Israelites, we forget what God has done. We lose hope of God's promise for us. We forget that God has given us grace. We forget God's promise that nothing can separate us from God's love. Like the Israelites, we stop trusting. And this leads to grumbling. This is what happens to those who oppose Jesus in the story we find in John's Gospel today. Those who do not understand Jesus, those who cannot perceive how this human whose parents they know, can claim to be the bread which is sent down from heaven. They do not understand, and they are not able to connect this Jesus with God's provision of life for them in the past. Jesus claims to be sent from God, to be their generation's holy manna, and yet they grumble, they complain, they challenge Jesus. Jesus responds in a way that seems like, it seems like he always does, cryptically. It would be so nice for him every once in a while to just respond in a straightforward way. But that's not Jesus' style. He seems to answer an entirely different question than the one that he has asked. But Jesus says something that actually addresses the root of their question. They grumble that Jesus said, I am the bread come down from heaven. They ask, how can this man claim to be from heaven? We know his parents, 
Jesus answers their question by telling them that all that they have is a gift from God. He reminds them of their ancestors who grumbled in the wilderness. When they grumbled, they received manna from heaven. They received their sustenance, that which they lacked as a gift from God. Jesus is telling them that in the same way, he is that gift. He is that bread which has come down from heaven. But the manna did not come down from heaven without its challenges. When the people first received the manna, they were told not to store it, as Barbara mentioned, not to collect it and put it in a safe place, but only collect what they needed for a day. Because God would continue to provide for them. Each day, they would find fresh manna. The people did not trust. Again, forgetting what God had done in the past, they hoarded the manna. And they tried to store it up for the next day so that they would have a guarantee that there would be food for them in the future. Yet, when the people woke the next morning, the manna they stored had spoiled, and they had nothing. But, lo and behold, God provided more manna for them. The people had to learn to trust God. They had to take their experience from the past and remember that God promised provision. They had to depend on God. They had to set aside their fears and trust that God would provide the manna. Jesus uses this story of faith to teach the people about God's provision. God has sent Jesus down from heaven as the bread of life to save the people to remind them of God's love and grace for them, that the people might come to depend upon God and trust in God. And Jesus uses this story to remind them to trust that God will provide, to remind them to open themselves up and be vulnerable with God. One of my uh, favorite authors is C.S. Lewis, creator of the world of Narnia, author of many wonderful works, devout Christian until his death in 1963, and it helps that he also happens to share my birthday. I have always been intrigued by Lewis's writing style and the ever-present sense of faith in his works. I recently reread one of his shorter books called A Grief Observed. This is a book which Lewis compiled out of journal entries he made after the death of his wife to cancer. Lewis writes an extremely candid account of his grief. He explores in almost a stream of conscious way the thoughts and ramblings he has as he copes with the loss of his beloved. This book is notable for its candidness, for Lewis's extreme vulnerability. In the book, Lewis does a lot of grumbling like the Israelites in the wilderness, like the op- those who opposed Jesus. Lewis grumbles about the loss of his wife, the pain that he has experienced, and the doubts that he feels about God's goodness. It is inspiring to see a man of faith really struggle. Yet despite all of his grumbling, Lewis comes out the other side of his grief, continuing to believe in and trust God. Now, he does not tie it up with a pretty bow, saying that everything has been resolved and he's perfectly happy now, because that's not how life works. But Lewis, like the Israelites, chooses in the end to trust God. In spite of the pain he experiences and the doubts that he feels at God's apparent absence, Lewis accepts his vulnerability by placing his trust in God. I believe that one of the most challenging things about faith, and it's almost one of its most important aspects, is trust. Trust in a God who promises to care for us. Trust in the Son which God sent into the world. Trust in the Spirit which continues to sustain us. I think trust is so difficult because it requires that we embrace our vulnerability, that we accept our fears, our doubts, our misgivings, 
and to offer them to God in faith. Being vulnerable is difficult for us. We prefer control. We prefer to be the masters of our fates and the captains of our souls. Trusting, being vulnerable, requires that we set aside that control. Set aside our power and accept control and power from someone else. We prefer to store up the manna, to guarantee that we will have some for tomorrow, like the Israelites. We prefer to reject Jesus as heaven-sent bread because we know who his parents are, like those who opposed Jesus. We prefer to rely on ourselves, to make our own luck, to assume that we are the only ones who can save us, rather than accepting that we are only saved by God's grace. Trust requires vulnerability. It requires setting aside our self-dependence. It requires that we not store up the manna, placing our hope in God and God's promise to provide for us. It requires that we rely on the bread sent from heaven, that we depend upon that spiritual food. Jesus, the Son of God himself. The good news is that we do not place our trust in someone who will fail us. The good news is that we are ceding our control, accepting vulnerability for the sake of God. We place our trust in the God who created all things, who knew us before we were even born. We place our trust in the Christ who chose us and chooses us to love us. We place our trust in the Holy Spirit that binds and knits us together and never forsakes us. We place our trust in a God who promises that nothing, nothing, nothing at all can separate us from God's love in the bread of heaven, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.